But I only saw it once, but I know in my heart it's still there. Now that's the interesting thing, that comment, I know in my heart it's still there. It's got a feeling that to it. it could be access if we could find the right way of doing it. <clears throat> and this is something that I spent all of my life, in a way, trying to access. Because ever since I was sort of very young, I've been subject to these sudden moments of complete, total happiness. I am basically a very cheerful sort of individual anyway. And I suppose this has influenced my own um, ideas, my own philosophy. I also feel, incidentally, that um, my ideas are not understood at all. Um, and that um, after I'm dead, no doubt, this will cease to be true. <laughs> I'm quite sort of lucky to happen while I'm still alive, if possible. <clears throat> because um, it seems to me that everything that uh, is represented by you know, postmodernism and so on is complete nonsense. And I won't see the back of it. So, let me try to um, explain the way that I got interested in this whole thing. These curious experiences of sudden and total happiness seem to me to be quite obviously something that um, lay behind the face of ordinary everyday experience and that we find it very difficult to get to simply because um, life is so complicated and we have to do so many other things. So maybe it's simply the problem of having too much to do. Then, in my teens, when I began to read poetry, I found that I could induce these moods, curious um, floating states of total happiness, simply by reading enough poetry, particularly if <coughs> I started off in a rather gloomy mood, a negative mood. The negative mood was very useful because it provided a kind of impetus. And then, once um, I'd begun to relax and to enjoy the poetry, I'd start off with very gloomy stuff, sort of Edgar Allan Poe and um, the Wasteland and so on. And then little by little, we'd get more cheerful as I went on reading, until finally, I was reading all kinds of things with a feeling of total happiness and relaxation. And I think this is the important thing. In 1962, I got a letter from an American professor of psychology called Abraham Maslow. Maslow said that as a psychologist, he got sick of studying sick people because sick people talk about nothing but their sickness. And so he asked around among his friends, who's the healthiest person you know? And he got a list of all the healthy people. He <laughs> and he began studying these healthy people instead. And he quickly discovered something that no one had ever discovered before, because no one ever thought of studying healthy people. That is that all these healthy people had with a fair degree of frequency what Maslow called peak experiences. And these weren't mystical experiences, they were just experiences of sheer, cheerful, bubbling, overwhelming happiness. So, for example, a young mother who was um, giving breakfast to her husband and kids, when a beam of sunlight suddenly came in through the window, and she suddenly thought, my God, I felt lucky, and went into the peak experience. Now, the interesting thing about that is that she was lucky before the beam of sunlight came through the window, the beam of sunlight, so to speak, only directed her attention in the right direction. So it's clearly, to a large extent, a matter of having your attention directed to something which is already there. One of my favorites that Maslow told me about was of a marine who spent years in the Pacific without seeing a woman. When he went back to base and saw a nurse, he immediately had a peak experience. <laughs> <laughs> He said, it suddenly struck him that women are different from men. <laughs> he said, we all think we know that, we take that for granted. He said, but you don't sort of realize that they're as totally different from men as horses are from cows. Now, that's what interests me so much, the way 
suddenly something fairly ordinary becomes a kind of revelation. And uh, Maslow went on to give me a lot of examples of people having peak experiences. He talked to his students about peak experiences. One of them described a peak experience when he was working his way through college, working as a jazz drummer. And one morning, at about two o'clock in the morning, suddenly drumming away, he said he couldn't do a thing wrong. It was absolutely perfect. And suddenly, he went into the peak experience. Um, William James talks about a football player who plays football technically brilliantly. And then one day when he's playing football, suddenly something happens to him, and suddenly the game begins to play him. And when that happens, nothing can go wrong. Now, they're all examples of peak experiences. But when Maslow talked to his students about peak experiences, the, the students began telling stories of their own peak experiences, like the one of the jazz drummer. And as soon as they began to do that, they began having peak experiences all the time. As soon as you turn your mind in that direction, you learn how to induce peak experiences. It's an incredibly simple thing to do. Now, another of my favorite um, stories concerns um, a book called Cosmic Consciousness by a man called Richard Morris Buck who describes at the beginning of the book how he'd spend the whole evening with friends reading their favorite poetry aloud, which included a lot of Walt Whitman, a lot of um, Wordsworth and that kind of thing, Tennyson. And when he left, and this, this I imagine will be around about 1900, he got into a cab, feeling completely relaxed and happy. And then as he was driving along, suddenly realized that there was a kind of red glow around and he thought, oh dear, there's a fire somewhere. And then, as he stared out of the window, he realized, no, that wasn't his talk. The red glow was coming from inside himself, bathing the whole carriage. And he said, then suddenly he just went into this experience, which he called cosmic consciousness, and which he thinks is a perfectly normal form of consciousness, slightly above the kind that we take for granted as ordinary. And that if you can suddenly get into this state of being free from ordinary consciousness, you're like a balloon that goes soaring up into the air. So this has been something that has always interested me deeply because it's obviously so closely connected with my own experiences of you know, sudden intense happiness. Now, when um, I discovered them, um, existentialism to read reading really Kierkegaard. I could say exactly what Kierkegaard meant, particularly that passage in a novel called Repetition, in which he says, you know, what are we doing here? Who put me here on this earth? Why wasn't I consulted first? <laughs> what am I supposed to do now I'm here? I'm, I'm going to see the director. Take me to see the director. And this feeling of, you know, take me to see the director is obviously the essence of existentialism. That feeling that life appears to be totally meaningless, and no matter how you scan it, it's like a very, very good poker player who doesn't give away the faintest hint of what he's holding in his hand. Now, the interesting thing for me was that this state um, could be induced in certain ways. I mean, my favorite story was the story of Graham Greene inducing it by playing Russian roulette with his brother's revolver. But um, when he was in a state of extreme depression as a schoolboy, because his father was the headmaster of Burton State School, and he found this very oppressive, being you know, the son of the headmaster, and um, got more and more suicidal, or more and more bored, until finally he got to a state where nothing seemed to him to be um, meaningful. Coleridge has um, a, a, a poem called Dejection and Ode, in which he talks about um, a dreary, drowsy, unimpassioned grief that finds no natural outlet or relief in word or sigh or tear. And then he says, um, 
O lady in this wan and heartless mood, to other thoughts by yonder thrust of wood, all through this eve so balmy and serene, have I been gazing on the western sky with its peculiar tint of yellow green. And so I gaze, and with half blank an eye, he says something about you know, clouds in bars that give away their motion to the stars. And then says, the wandering moon, as, as bright as if it blew in its own cloudless, peerless lake of blue, I see them all so excellently fair. I see, not feel, how beautiful they are. Now that's exactly what Green experienced. That feeling of just feeling nothing, just feeling dead inside. And so when he discovered brother, uh, his brother's revolver in a corner cupboard, he took it on the berth and said, Common, and played Russian roulette. He put one bullet in the chambers, spun the chambers, pointed it at his head, and pulled the trigger. And when there was just a click, he looked down the barrel and saw that the bullets had now come into position, so he missed it by just one. And he said he experienced an overwhelming feeling, absolute sheer happiness. He said suddenly as if it was as if a light had been turned on, and I suddenly saw that life is infinitely interesting and exciting. But of course, it didn't last. And fairly quickly, he was back in his normal state of you know, boredom and irritation. And he actually did it six times, I think, in all. And unfortunately, this death, because I think he's one of the worst modern novelists. <laughs> but there obviously are ways of doing it that involve um, some tension that jerks you out of your normal state of consciousness. And that's the essence of it, simply getting out of the normal state of consciousness. Now, when um, I got very interested in Sartre and Camus, the time when um, I started to write The Outsider, this was um, in 1954. What had happened was that my girlfriend Joy, who now my wife, had gone back home for Christmas, and I didn't have enough money to put the train fare for Leicester. So I stayed on um, in my room, which was in Rockley, and uh, spent Christmas making notes for a book. I was, I'd been trying to write a novel so far that a writer in the museum, British Museum, called Angus Wilson, had offered to read what I'd done so far. So I typed up the first part of the novel and given it to him. And uh, that meant that I had nothing to do over Christmas, so I began sketching out ideas for a book. The original title was The Outsider in Literature. And he covered all kinds of people from Hamlet um, down to modern existentialism. All people who felt that they were basically misfits, which, you know, they weren't in a sense suited at all to the modern world. And um, I sketched out these ideas. And then, as soon as the Christmas break was over, went off to the British Museum, where I'd been working on my novel, I think called Richard and the Dark, and um, decided that I would begin writing The Outsider. Now, on my way to the museum, I suddenly remembered a book which I once read about by Henri Vabius, um, a French novelist, um, in the introduction to the Everyman edition of his book, um, Le Feu, Under Fire, about the First World War. Apparently, Barbius's first novel was about a man who stands um, on his bed when he sees a bit of light coming through a little hole near the ceiling, peers through the hole and sees that he can see everything in the next room. And from there on, of course, he spends all his time peering through his hole at the people that come and go in the next room, mostly hoping to see girls getting undressed. And uh, he, um, it, it suddenly struck me as I was cycling to the museum, my God, what a symbol of the outsider. So the first thing I did when I got to the museum was look up Barbius's hell with a long fair in the catalogue and order it. And it came at about three o'clock in the afternoon, the library closed at five. And um, I settled down, read through most of the book, and then just quickly sketched down some notes and the first thing I copied out was a man saying, 
that um, he says in the air on the top of a tram, a girl is sitting and her dress blows up slightly in the wind. And then the, suddenly the tram car rolls away. And he says, it is not a woman I want, it is all women. And then he goes on to say that he picks up a prostitute, goes back to her room, and he said it passed like a sun falling down. This was not at all what he was after. Somehow the experience he was looking for, he missed totally and completely. And this fascinated me. This fact, you know, the sexual response itself, once again, um, is no reliable guide to its own satisfaction. Yeats had said in one of his poems about the problem of our inability to achieve the satisfaction of our desires. He'd said, um, I said there was a waterfall upon Ben Bolden's side that all my childhood counted dear. If I had travelled far and wide, I could not find anything more dear. I would have touched it like a child, but knew my fingers would have touched cold stone and water. I grew wild, even accusing heaven because it had set down among its laws. Nothing that we love overmuch is ponderable to the touch. This is what fascinated me. This feeling that there's nothing you can do that will actually get you any closer to this desire that we all feel so strongly. It's rather like you know, the dodgings on the fairground. You, you turn the wheel one way and it goes in the opposite direction. And human desires appear to be the same kind of thing. Dr. Johnson had said the same sort of thing in a novel called Rassilas, Prince of Abyssinia, in which Rassilas uh, is talking um, with his um, tutor, and the tutor said to him, surely there must be some sense or some desire apart from a sense which must be satisfied before we can be truly happy. Again, it's recognition. And Yeats again says in a play called The Shadowy Waters that uh, what, no, anyway, what he's saying basically is that there must be some way in which we can satisfy this basic desire that all poets feel. So, I think then that it should be possible to logically and rationally begin to understand how to do something about this. Now, it seemed fairly obvious to me that Sartre and Camus were pursuing a kind of completely different line, and yet in a certain sense had come fairly close to it. The thing that interested me most in Sartre was a remark he'd made that during the war, when he was in the French resistance and was therefore likely to be arrested and shot at any moment, he had never felt so free. The interesting thing is that Sartre himself was a depressive who simply just did not feel free. And he was like this for most of his life, a completely depressed sort of person. And uh, made no real attempt to get out of it. Now, it seems to me that this is the basic problem with the philosophy of Sartre and Camus. In La Nausée, Nausea, Sartre talks about his character, Rocantin, who is a historian, writing a history of a diplomat called Robon. And again and again, he experiences these awful feelings of some total meaninglessness. Now, <clears throat> The interesting thing is that when Sartre um, was a young man, he decided that he would try taking mescaline because he wanted to see whether it would have any interesting psychological effects that he could use in his novel. In fact, it not only had interesting effects, it was the basis of the novel. What I said at the beginning of this long piece of my called anti is, in February 1936, 
Jean Poussard was writing his book, L'Imagination, and became interested in the problem of dreams and dream imagery. One of his former students, now a doctor, suggested that Sartre should go to St. Anne's Hospital and have a mescaline injection, which might induce hallucinations. A housemaid who tried it told, sorry, a houseman who tried it told Sartre it was a delightful experience. He romped in flowery meadows full of ooze. Sartre's experience was altogether less pleasant. Um, he had a classic bad trip. Later the same day, he talked to Simone de Beauvoir on the telephone and told her that um, before she interrupted, he'd been having a battle with some devil fish, uh, which would probably, would, um, would probably um, he would probably have lost. He was lying in a dimly lit room, and umbrellas seemed to turn into vultures, shoes into skeletons, faces leered at him, and crabs and polyps seemed hovering on the edge of his vision. In the train on his way home, he was convinced that an orangutan was hanging from the roof by its feet and peering in through the window. The next day, he was back to normal, um, but feeling very depressed. Again, the mescaline hallucinations returned. Houses seemed to become leering faces. Clocks turned into owl's faces. He was convinced that there was a lobster trotting behind him. These unpleasant and he hated them shellfish. These unpleasant after effects seemed to have persisted for many weeks after the original injection. He was still suffering intense depression months later. Now, what interested me about that experience was that all this Huxley told me about it, he advised me to take mescaline. And um, I had uh, accordingly got some mescaline sulfate. It wasn't difficult to get there, you could simply get it with a medical prescription. I'd taken it expecting and hoping that I would sort of have the same kind of experience as Huxley. That is, you know these wonderful feelings when everything suddenly became brighter and more brilliant. He said that a deck chair made of red and yellow stripes suddenly looked as if it made of blazing red and yellow fire. And so everything he said suddenly just leapt into existence. Everything existed ten times as much as before. Well, I found that it didn't have this effect on me at all. On the contrary, um, the first thing he did was make me nauseous and I vomited for something like three quarters of an hour. Then when my stomach was completely empty, and I was lying on bed trying hard not to keep reaching, I gradually began to succeed in overcoming the feeling of sickness, but I um, still sort of felt very, very weak. Then, in this feeling of weakness, I suddenly had the feeling of sort of a curious relaxation and happiness. And the more I relaxed, the more strongly I felt this. It was as if I was lying on a kind of water, on a, um, a blow-up rock, on a gently rocking sea, completely and totally relaxed. And there was a feeling of really marvelous innocence everywhere. There were no visual effects at all, only this sort of feeling. But I felt terribly guilty about it all because I felt to begin with, you know, here am I, a father with my wife and a small daughter. What am I doing in this completely helpless state, unable to make any kind of effort if they were attacked or something of the sort? My wife brought me in a lamb chop and I could no more have eaten it than I could have eaten my own daughter. It seemed absolutely horrible. It was too real. And uh, later on that afternoon, we went out to the village fete in the vicar on the vicarage lawn, and everything seemed very weird, you know, a strange kind of feeling of double exposure. For example, I had a very, very strong feeling that the whole of the district around Coran Haven, where I live in Cornwall, was connected with witchcraft. Um, I've never tried to check this. But I've no doubt that it was true. It was such a very, very powerful feeling. And uh, anyway, 
I, I hated the mess school, and I kept saying to myself, my God, I'll never take this bloody filthy stuff again. And uh, unfortunately, that wasn't the end of it. It kept kind of rifting back on me for days afterwards, particularly if I ate radishes. I was to get this flash of mescaline experience. Incidentally, though, one thing I did mention was that I met Mar Marilyn Monroe on a couple of occasions. And not really, no. I mean, and what's more, I, this, this person I conceded, I thought she was pretty strongly attractive to me. And this was simply with my ordinary glasses and looking rather like Arthur Miller. And I think she had a natural, a natural inclination towards sort of intellectuals. And um, the result was that when we, uh, Miller and I were on stage at the Royal Court in a debate once, so and Marilyn was sitting in the front row, we all had to sneak out of the back because the giant crowds were waiting outside to see her. And it was my hand she grabbed tightly as we were walking out of the, the theatre. So I always had this feeling of strong, some powerful attraction. And, you know, I, I'd always had this with sort of little bombs like Marilyn Monroe. That's kind of ding! And there it goes again. <laughs> and uh, so, what did surprise me was that in the, um, under the mescaline experience, the innocence that I was feeling so powerfully was definitely symbolized by Marilyn Monroe. It was almost as if she was there, present. Later on, when I went to Hollywood, I, I thought, I must go and call on her. And then I thought, oh my God, no, I am better. The first thing that had happened was that a picture of us would appear in some paper and Joy would think the worst, and she quite right. And so I didn't. Later on, I regretted it enormously, simply because the poor girl badly needed somebody to go along and see her. It was in those last days before she committed suicide. So this masculine experience convinced me that our minds do have this curious power to open up to a much wider range of experience. And in this case, the kind of wider range I did not want. You see, my mind on the whole is very good at concentrating. And when I get really carried away and enthusiastic, it concentrates like a searchlight beam. It will pick up things with extreme clarity. And if I get really carried away and really excited, it concentrates still further until it turns into something like a laser. Now these are my peak experiences, these are the best things I experience, and these experiences would be impossible under mescaline, which opened up my mind like that. It's absolutely impossible. I mean, I just felt as if I was being raped, as it were, by the universe. Or, or as if I had a large Alsatian dog putting his paws on my shoulders and licking my face, and that's why I push it up and they go away. So I can see very clearly what is the problem. We are capable of these curious wide open moods in which suddenly we tune into all kinds of things. But it obviously happened to this girl walking up the cornfield. And yet, on the whole, it's not the kind of thing that would do us any good. I'm pretty sure that animals have this capacity to a very large extent. That is, to tune in to all kinds of things that we human beings um, are completely unaware of. I mean, for example, a parrot is able to read our minds and knows instantly when we want to put him back in his cage and go and hide somewhere. And I'm sure you know, that the dogs in the same sort of way know can read my mind when I'm about to go out. And this is not because you know, they know what time I go out. Very often they decide to go out, you know, unexpectedly. But the Scottish bird, Hugh McDermott, had a dog. And um, his wife said to me that he'd always knew when he was coming back from a long journey. And on the other side of the world. And we'd go and sit at the end of his lane for a couple of days before he reappeared. So animals undoubtedly have this curious sixth sense. But of course it doesn't do them any particular good. I mean, what good did it do a dog to sit there for two days? So, this is the problem with it. I mean, it can do some good. The tiger hunter Jim Corbett, who wrote a book called Man Eaters of Kumaon, said that again and again during his lifetime, this curious sixth sense had saved his life. 
by, by telling him there was a tiger lying in the undergrowth waiting to leap out on him. And he, he said, on one occasion, he had been walking back along, walking out along the road in the morning, out of his bungalow, seeing his footsteps in the dust where he'd walked um, back home the evening before, and that at a certain point, he noticed that his footsteps went to the other side of the road, and then back again. He thought, why on earth did I do that? Because he couldn't remember it. He went to have a look and saw that there was a kind of low culvert where he crossed the road. And when he looked over this low culvert, he saw in the dust below the paw marks of a tiger, which had been lying by the culvert. His unconscious mind had picked up the tiger, which probably wouldn't have attacked him anyway. And he'd simply but had not taken the risk, he'd simply sent him to the other side of the road. Now clearly, this kind of um, jungle consciousness, he called it, is extremely valuable if you're a tiger hunter. But if you're in central London, it's no particular use. And therefore, we human beings have got rid of it a long time ago. Although actually it's still there if we really need to revive it. Nearly all these faculties are still there. So this um, is the reason that we can't contact all kinds of faculties because they're of no particular use to us. Now, what I've discovered <coughs> is that in point of fact, you can, if you quite deliberately make this effort, induce these curious states of insight or power consciousness. One of my most interesting experiences and the one that really came as a breakthrough took place um, in the new year of 1979. I was returning uh, from a place called Sheepwash, which is a farm in the middle of Devon, where I'd spent, I'd gone up for the night to lecture to a group of people, and it had started to snow, and it snowed and snowed and snowed. And the next morning there was no chance of getting out of this farm. I mean, the farmyard to begin with was in a hollow in the centre of the farm. <coughs> and the snow was two feet thick on the ground. So there was nothing for it. We just had to wait around. And of course, we waited all that day. The next day was just as bad. There was no chance of getting out. And at that point, some of us decided we really would like to get out. And so what we tried doing was to see if we could push the car up out of the farmyard and onto the level ground and then take it across the road, which is about half a mile long, up to the main road. Well, oddly enough, mine was the only car that would do this. And, um, you know, those tires just didn't spin helplessly in the snow. And with the help of a lot of other people pushing back of the car, we got it to the top, <coughs> and then proceeded to drive across the road, which was completely covered in snow. At one point, we actually went straight across the middle of the field and um, got back to the main road. Then I walked all the way back to the farm and had some lunch. And then some lady said she would like to come with me to get as far as St. So I said, OK. Off we went, got into the car. And of course, I had to drive terribly, terribly slowly because the road from Sheepwash was no more than sort of from here to the table there. In other words, there was room for only one car on it. And once more, it had a ditch on either side. And it was impossible to see where the ditch was because it was full of snow. But I realised that if I went off into the ditch, then I'd never get out. I'd have to get the AA on and so on and so forth. So I was driving with extreme care and caution and concentration. And I had to continue to do this for about an hour or an hour and a half. Finally, I got to um, back to the main exit of Rome, which had been all churned up by lorries, and was able to relax for the first time. And what I found as I then proceeded to drive from there on was that this concentration had induced in me a curious sort of semi-mystical state. Although when I start talking about semi-mystical state, I'm giving entirely the wrong impression. All that it had done 
was to wake me up far more, you know, than I normally awake. It gave me a very, very strong, powerful feeling of the reality of the world around me. You know, as I was driving along the road, I, I would want to turn my head as I passed a tree or, an, or um, a telegraph pole. Everything looked fascinating. And this lasted all the way home. Now, it made me realize that simply by concentrating like mad with the feeling of crisis for an hour and a half, I push my consciousness up to a higher state. And that this is all that's meant by high states of consciousness. Just this intense concentration. And what I've discovered since then, at first I thought, you know, well, it can't really be done at will. It had to be done by this feeling of crisis driving along this snow-covered road. But actually, I've slowly discovered that this is not so. I can now go to Tesco on a Thursday morning. I can concentrate very hard in the 30 minutes that it takes me to get from Warren Hayman to Tesco's in Shore Road, and during that time, get myself into a similar state of intense happiness, because that's what it amounts to. Ustensky, who'd done a chapter in a book of his called The New Model of the Universe, about basically mystical experience, said that one of the, after describing the mystical experience and so on, which I think he induced with nitrous oxide. But one of the things he says is that something that he hadn't bothered to mention was that the intense ecstatic happiness of the state, it certainly does put you into a wonderful state of sort of, you know, pure optimism and bubbling happiness. I also discovered another thing, that when you are in that state of optimism and bubbling happiness, everything tends to get right. But it's when you're in sort of miserable moods that things tend to go wrong. I've noticed this again and again and again. So that you gradually begin to get a feeling that, you know, you're living in a, a meaning universe. And all you have to do is make these efforts, like the effort I was forced to make driving back from Sheepock. And you can suddenly see the meaning. It becomes not only visible, but something that you can amplify if you want to. Now, it seems to me, you see, that someone like Sartre had no capacity for this kind of relaxation, as obviously Graham Greene didn't either. And as obviously Canby did. When, um, I went to see Canby one afternoon in his office there in Gallimard's in Paris, and um, I began talking to him in very bad French because he didn't speak any English. So, you know, it wasn't an easy conversation, so my French is a little bit louder. But I was asking him about this pessimism in his work and about the fact that there are quite a number of places in his work in which a person experiences just this tremendous, overwhelming universal happiness. One of them is, the, is at the end of his first novel, uh, Le Tranger, which is translated usually as The Outsider, in which the hero loses his temper with a priest who's advising him to repent and all the rest of it, he's about to be executed for a murder he didn't commit, seizes him by the throat and shakes him, and this suddenly completely releases a feeling of relaxation and happiness. And he says that when the priest had gone, looking out at the night sky, he had this feeling of total happiness. And he makes this interesting observation. I knew that I'd been happy, and I was happy still. And yet, if you read the book itself, the Tranche, you see this about an apparently thoroughly bored man who starts off by saying, Mother died yesterday. I went to the funeral, you know, not much happened. It was all rather boring. Then he goes to bed with the girl afterwards, and she says, do you love me? And he says, no. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he obviously tells an absolute, complete truth. And he just feels that, you know, life is like that. Life is boring and flat. And of course, Sartre, at the end of being a nothingness, had used this same phrase, it is meaningless that we live and meaningless that we die. 
and then ends the book with the phrase, man is a useless passion. It was obvious that Camus felt the same, but I pointed out to Camus that there are two or three places in his work. There's another one in the story called The Woman Taken in Adultery, in which a woman standing naked in the African night ex suddenly has this curious experience of, as if we're having sex with the universe, a feeling of total blending with the universe. And there's another one in um, an essay of his in a volume called Long Vey on Duat, about standing on the beach at Jamila and having this feeling of his own weight of his life upon his own shoulders with a strange feeling of reality. And I, I mentioned these two cameo, and I said, surely this is the really worthwhile thing to investigate, these moments of tremendous intensity. And Camus, who was standing by the window of his office, gestured as a sort of Parisian teddy boy, walking past in the street below, and said, in French, no, what is good for him must be good for me also. And I just got rather in indignantly excited and said, what are you talking about? Supposing Einstein had said, what is good for him it must be good for me also. It never produced the theory of relativity. The very essence of any kind of intellectual creativity is that you don't accept, as it were, the lowest common denominator. Anyway, we did not see eye to eye on this at all. And it was quite obvious to me that Camus, in a sense, had accepted this notion of the universe as basically a rather flat, boring place. And uh, three years later, I was just leaving the house to go pick up Joy from the station. She'd been away for the weekend. And the phone rang, and the French voice said, Mr. Bilson? And I said, yes. And he said, so this is l'agence littéraire or something or so. And then went on to say, have you heard that Albert Camus was dead? So I assumed it was a friend of mine called Bill Hopkins who was always bringing me up and pretending to be a Chinese laundry or something. And so I said, oh, come off it, Bill. And this chap was obviously so puzzled that he gradually did dawn upon it that Camus really was dead. And apparently what had happened was that he was driving along with Michel Gallimard from the publishers. And um, the car had skidded off the road and hit a tree, and Camus just spun straight through the back when he had broken his neck. Now, as I was going in to meet Joy, I was thinking, isn't it absurd? And I thought, oh, ha, yes, that's what Camus would have said. <coughs> absurd. Meaningless. That sudden feeling of total absurdity, because the absurd is what Camus called what's up with nausea, that feeling of meaninglessness. But I thought, you know, it's a funny thing, isn't it? But as soon as you suddenly decide that the universe is genuinely meaningless and absurd, along comes fate and zonks you on the back of the head. And in a sense, you deserve it. I've always had this feeling that it's possible to change things that happen to you by a form of focused concentration. Now, certainly Sartre did not believe in anything of the sort. And uh, the result is that the underlying feeling of most of his work is this basic feeling of sort of boredom. There's a passage in which Camus talks about the way that the absurd suddenly dawns upon someone. And what he says is this, this is in the myth of Sisyphus. He says, absurdity, what Sartre means by contingency. That is to say, you know, something not being necessary. And um, it begins by speaking frankly about boredom. The rising streetcar, four hours in the office, or the factory, meal, streetcar, four hours of work, meal, sleep and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, according to the same rhythm. But one day, the why arises, arises, and everything begins from that weariness tinged with amazement. Now, you can see that what he's saying there is perfectly simple. Um, it's, he has let himself slip into automatism. 
This is something that I recognize at a fairly early stage. How easy it is to be taken over completely by something that you might call, you know, the robot inside you. We all have a kind of robot in the unconscious mind, which does things for us, which is extremely useful, so that, you know, we learn to do something painfully and consciously, like talking French, driving a car, or whatever. And then after a little bit, the robot takes over and does it far more efficiently than we can do it consciously. So that, you know, sometimes you, when you're feeling tired, you suddenly find you're back home again, can't remember driving home, the robot has driven you home. The only problem is that the robot not only does the things you want him to do, he does the things you don't want him to do. So that, for example, if I discover some particularly nice country walk around where I live in Cornwall, the first time it's absolutely wonderful and exciting, and then gradually the robot takes away the excitement until the fourth or fifth time. It's no longer exciting because it's the robot walking as well as me. The two of them going on at the same time. I said I'd even caught him making love to my wife. <laughs> it's extremely difficult um, to stop the robot. Except, as I say, on that occasion driving back from sheep wash, sheer intensity had made the robot get out of the way. And once the robot actually agrees to shut up and get out of the way, then, suddenly, you can push yourself into these states of intensity. And this, you see, I'm saying is possible for all human beings all the time. Now, it struck me that what is wrong with Sarge is something to do with the basic form of his existentialism. Um, he had been having a drink um, with um, a friend called Raymond Aron um, in Paris. And Aron had just returned from Berlin, where he'd been um, studying Heidegger. And Aron started to tell him about Husserl, Edmund Husserl, who was the founder of phenomenology. And he said to Sartre, um, if you studied phenomenology, you'd be able to philosophize about that cocktail, according to a fruit cocktail on the table. And Sartre became incredibly excited, <laughs> rushed off to the nearest bookshop and bought anything he could find on Husserl. And then, of course, um, began uh, talking about Husserl all the time. Now, what Husserl had discovered, in fact, was extremely interesting and simple. Um, he had realized that whenever we, um, whenever we perceive anything, Perception is a deliberate act of intentionality, like a, like a, a theatre of hurling a javelin. If you look at your watch without any kind of intentionality, you don't remember what time it was and you have to look again a few seconds later. You have to look with intentionality. And this intentionality applies to all our conscious acts. We have to keep on doing it. Now, clearly, you can see that what happened to me driving back from sheep wash was that sheer concentration had pushed up my <coughs> level of intentionality until it was much higher than usual. And as soon as my le level of intentionality was much higher than usual, everything was more interesting and exciting. Now, um, Husserl, in fact, had said that um, behind consciousness, there lies another you, which he called the transcendental ego, using Kant's phrase. Now, in a sense, all of this was a revolt against the philosophy of David Hume. Hume had said that when he looked inside himself for the real David Hume, he just found a lot of ideas of perception, sort of flying around like leaves in the wind, but no sign at all of the real David Hume. And the result was that Hume suggested that all of our so-called acts of consciousness are merely association of ideas. You know, one thing leads to another and so on. Now, this kind of thing, in fact, um, had first been said with any clarity in 1748 by a French philosopher called La Métrie, who wrote a book called Man the Machine. And he just suggested in Man the Machine that everything about us can be explained in terms of pure mechanicalness. And uh, 
From then on, the French had been very enthusiastic after rejecting him totally. And of course, towards the end of the 18th century, lots and lots of French philosophers were quite enthusiastic about this idea. And in due course, it became the central notion um, of French philosophy. For example, in the um, physiology of Auguste Comte. So the notion that man... There's something about the way, but I see a lot of people sort of rather hot. Yes, please do. Let, let's open some more way, shall we? Just a minute. What about the door at the back? So, French philosophy, after that point, around about the time of the French Revolution, became very, very much um, mechanical. And the physiologist called Cabarrus said that basically we are quite simple machines and that you could explain this entirely in terms of nerve impulses. Now, um, at that point, one of their group, um, and they called themselves the ideologues, a man called Man de Biron, said, wait a minute, that's not true. He said, when I make an effort of will, I'm thoroughly aware that it's me making it. And in that moment, you suddenly get that feeling that Buckminster followed it when he said, I seem to be a So, this should have made a total change in the direction of French philosophy. In fact, it made no change or whatever. Because the French had this natural tendency to a kind of materialism. And of course, it continued throughout the 19th century. Again, a really major figure. Um, who disagreed with Henri Bergson. Now, Madame de Biron's insight, nevertheless, that insight which is, in effect, I seem to be a verb, is of terrific importance. And when Rousseau um, began doing philosophy, he was particularly fascinated by this fact that what distinguishes our mental acts from purely physical acts, which can be construed as completely automatic or physiological, is this element of intentionality. But this raises an interesting question. If our perceptions are intentional, rather like an archer firing an arrow to target, then who is the archer? This is the really fascinating question. Now, Kant had said, that behind consciousness there lies something called the transcendental ego. And that the transcendental ego is the archer behind consciousness. And um, this was the conclusion that Husserl came to. Now, um, he went on to create a whole philosophy based around this notion of the intentionality, the philosophy of phenomenology. And it was an attempt to make philosophy for the first time into something truly scientific, logical. Because what almost all major philosophers have recognized is that philosophy is a terrible mess, just a, a, a lot of contradictions. So Husserl's notion of intentionality seems to me to be, again, one of the absolutely fundamental things as a basis for philosophy. But when Sartre um, began writing, one of the first things he produced in the 1930s, he was born in um, 1905, and so it was um, sort of in the, his early 30s, was a little book called The Transcendence of the Ego. It's almost unknown. And what he said in The Transcendence of the Ego was,